Glad to see everyone here on a Saturday morning. We'll call the 2023 NCAL Summer Property and Casualty Insurance Committee meeting to order. I'm Edmund Jordan and I'll be chairing this committee today. I'm asking for a motion to waive the quorum. Second. It's been probably moved and second. All in favor? Opposed? Quorum is waived. Uh, we'll start today with the introduction and discussion of proposed amendments to the NCAR Model State Uniform Building Code sponsored by Utah Representative Jim Dunnigan and co-sponsored by Georgia Representative Matthew Gamble. Several states, including my home state of Louisiana, have enacted laws that encourage homeowners to take steps to strengthen their homes by providing them with insurance discounts if certain standards are met. And I'll just add that we just did this again with the Fortified Roof Program uh, this past year. Uh, the laws do vary in terms of methods of encouragement. Some states require the insurer to issue a premium discount if certain standards are met while others make the discount voluntary. And in Louisiana, we do make it voluntary. Uh, Louisiana also has a program, again, with the fortified roofs. Uh, Representative Dunnigan was scheduled to be here, but unfortunately, he had something urgent come up and he couldn't join us. Uh, there are some technical changes to the model that are wholly separate from the premium discount amendments that are also sponsored by Representative Dunnigan. But since he isn't here today, we're going to hold off on considering them until our November meeting. Since Representative Dunnigan isn't here, I'll uh, just briefly present the amendments so everyone can follow along. The amendments are on page 317 in your binders and on the website and the app. The amendments are intended to go into the existing NCOR model state uniform building code, which is in your binders on page 321. And again, they're on the website and the app as well. With Representative Dunnigan being from a state that has been experiencing an increasing amount of wildfires, he's very interested in different policy approaches that encourage homeowners and renters to take steps to strengthen their property from natural disasters. As some of us know, NCOR did discuss these amendments back in 2018, which are based on Oklahoma law, but the proposal was ultimately withdrawn as the consensus could not be reached. But now with the unfortunate increase in natural disasters, this is a very timely topic, and I'm glad that NCOR is discussing it again. Just a couple of more notes and I'll stop. You'll see in the language that the premium discount is only required if the insurer determines that is actuarially justified and that there is sufficient and credible evidence of cost savings, which can be attributed to the construction standards set forth in the model. Representative Dunnigan has stressed that he thinks uh, that's important language and protects against unnecessary discounts being issued which could in turn significantly impact insurer solvency and end up harming consumers. I'll stop there and just note that this is the first round of discussions and changes can certainly be made going forward. With that, we'll now hear from our speakers. With us here today are Valerie Brown of United Policyholders, Matt Overturf of the National Association of Mutual Insurance Companies, and Hillary Segura of the Prop American Property Casualty Insurance Association. We'll hold questions until everyone is finished and we'll hear from Valerie first. Are you on? Test it one more time. Now I'm on, right? Yes, there we go. Good. Sorry about that. Um, thank you for having me today. So today, United Policyholders would like to highlight the differing approaches we're seeing to incentivizing, rewarding, and facilitating mit mitigation. So a little bit about United Policyholders. We're a national nonprofit. We serve as a trusted voice and information resource for consumers in all 50 states, formed after the 1991 Oakland Hills wildfire. Our Roadmap to Recovery program has served disaster survivors since that fire in Hurricane Andrew the next year and currently serving Hurricane Ian and uh, wildfires and flooding across the country. 
we're based in California, professional staff of 15. We partner heavily with government and NGOs, and we leverage our team up partners, uh, volunteers to provide that in insurance education and information across the country. And what makes us unique is our survivor to survivor volunteers. Uh, we, when we serve in a community, those previous catastrophic loss survivors that we've worked with continue volunteering with us to help current survivors by sharing their very unique, hard-won knowledge about the insurance claims process. So that right now in California, there's a lot of energy, time, and money going into reducing wildfire risk. The FireWise USA program is just uh, growing rapidly in the state. IBHS is rolling out their wildfire prepared home. They're testing that in paradise. We spent three year, the last three years working on what we call the wildfire risk reduction and asset protection initiative that's now a project. Um, and we have a resource center dedicated to that. And what we're doing is really helping property owners know what to do, how to improve their home's chances of surviving a wildfire. We're all working on the same page to make that happen. This is our RAP Resource Center, which provides those very hyper-local resources, ways to assess your home, obviously checking for those insurance discounts to motivate homeowners to take those steps and how to get started. What we can't do, these are the things we can't do, is control the weather or those earthquakes or any of these disasters, right? We can't put that modeling drone, the imaging, back in the bottle. We can't force property owners to make the improvements if they can't afford to make it. And what we can't do is leave property owners and their mortgage lenders without insurance options. But what we can do is coordinate among those state stakeholders and partners. We can research to risk reduction. We can facilitate risk reduction, incentivize it, reward it, and provide financial assistance for that. And that's one of the things we do in our RAP Resource Center is not only talk about those mitigation steps, but what grants and funding opportunities are there for homeowners to make a difference. So, and these are the imperatives as we see them. We need to understand what is effective in risk reduction techniques and options. What's going to move the needle? What will insurers um, validate that will improve a home's protection? We need to establish those standards, the partnerships, and viable mitigation support programs to make it. Because the goal is to afford, preserve affordable, quality property insurance options. The options that we see are premium discounts. And you can see mandatory with a specific percentage, mandatory but not a, a specific percentage, or voluntary. Uh, California, we're doing statutory limits on non-renewals to provide protection in communities impacted by wildfire. Um, Insurer-funded mitigation, we're seeing some of those pilot projects. There's right now a lot of dollars being put into government-funded mitigation. And so talking about IBHS, um, you know, the mandated discounts based on their standards. So most statutes that mandate those discounts require that they um, meet an insurance industry standard. And so everybody, as, as the, uh, the committee chair from Louisiana mentioned, the Fortified Program is the standard here. Uh, there's in California also a program called Safer from Wildfires. Um, and, and focusing on IBHS, what they did with Fortified really has moved the needle as far as wind events. And what they're doing now in the pilot project for the campfire is taking all of the research done on ember damage, ember caused fire damage, and um, wildfire in general, and putting that into a similar program that they're piloting in Paradise, California, which was impacted by the 2018 campfire. And I'm not going to go into detail on these. A lot of this is so you have this as reference, but these are the details of the gold, the fortified gold, silver programs. So just touching on the Mississippi Code, it's, they require the licensed insurers to provide a mandated discount rate to anyone who follows the IBHS mitigation standards. Um, it's, it's a very uh, limited subset of people that are impacted and has it available to them. Only, it's only required for policies that provide wind coverage, only homeowners in selected coastal cities, and it excludes multifamily manufactured home and businesses. So the requirement to offer notify, um, some states do require that you do it, others don't mandate. 
Um, and some of these programs are just voluntary in a community, and I'll touch on a few of those in just a minute. And so for this one, I think we all agree in the West, there is a need for wildfire mitigation, and so we need to provide a way to mo motivate people to take advantage of this. Um, so right now in the West, we're experiencing an uh, ever-growing availability and affordability crisis. And you've seen national news. Uh, insurers in California specifically are just not taking new, uh, new policies. They're not issuing them. They're raising premiums on the customers they keep. Um, some of them are imposing mitigation requirements in excess of state requirements that are just not feasible for peace, people to do. I, I have one homeowner who was required to clear uh, 100 feet out. Their property line goes to 30. They cannot mitigate the, less, the next 70 feet because that is their neighbor's property. So they're in a situation where they cannot bend. And this is leaving people in rural areas, especially rural Californians, with very limited and expensive options. So they're looking at surplus lines, they're looking at the California Fair Plan. The California Fair Plan is about 300,000 uh, policies currently, but that will grow. And what's, what's causing a lot of the issues here is this risk classification-based modeling using Fireline and CoreLogic. That's what's dominating a lot of insurers' underwriting criteria. And so to put it in perspective, Fireline, which is used by insurers in 13 Western states, has a scale of 1 to 30. In California, most insurers will not underwrite a, a home with a score of a 4. You've got to be a 1 to 3. Two years ago, it was a 6. That keeps dropping. And what's interesting, it's dropped after the larger wildfires. So in 21-22, less wildfires, more acres lost, but less wildfires damaging, destroying homes. But the score keeps dropping. CoreLogic has a scale of 1 to 10. It's used in 15 western states and Florida. And I met a gentleman at a presentation I gave Wednesday night before flying out here who was not renewed by his insurance company because he had a score of a 2. He's 20 blocks inland in the town from the, uh, in, in 20 blocks from the wildland urban interface area. Um, there's nothing he can do to improve his score. He's done all the mitigations, and he has a 2 on a scale of 1 to 10, and he can't get insurance. So talking about California, just briefly um, as a case study, um, the tree mortality was a big driver of this in the beginning. Climate change is obviously pushing it over, and this over-reliance on the use of risk classification models, they're just creating this perfect storm we're seeing of insurance unaffordability and unavailability in those brush areas, that wildland urban interface. Um, so from our, our 2017 survey, 47% of homeowners were told that that high fire line score made them uninsurable. Um, most of those people, um, were in, their insurance companies were not making recommendations of things they could do to mitigate that risk in order to reduce that risk. The survey we just completed in 2022 saw 72% of the homeowners were told a, higher fire, a high fire line score made them uninsurable. Bear in mind, when I look at, uh, when, when you look at a scale of 1 to 30, and you tell me high, I'm thinking 15, 20 is a score. The idea that it's a 4 is very confusing for consumers. Um, and then 94% of those said that their insurer had still made no recommendations on what they could do to reduce that risk. During this time from 2020 to 2022, in the state of California, we've seen an explosion of uh, activities to define that science, including the IBHS program that has rolled out. Um, but it hasn't translated yet into insurers providing some guidance on what people can do. So who can be part of the solution? The fire safe councils, firewise communities, obviously government, community organizations, very much so insurance commissioners, and we believe heavily that insur insurance insurer partnerships at working with the community are key to making this happen. And so here are three uh, successful programs that we've seen. Wildfire Partners in Boulder, Colorado is doing a really good job. I'll talk about them a little more in a minute. The Fire Safe Council program does an excellent job, and they're very good at securing community grants to help leverage what individuals are doing in the community. And, and we're seeing in the western states, the western fire, fire chiefs are putting in a lot of effort into coming up with programs where they are helping their communities and leveraging federal and state dollars to make that happen. 
talking about wildfire partners. It's a partnership between Boulder County, FEMA, and Colorado Department of Natural Resources. Say so they provide an inspection, uh, looking at vegetation in the defensible space. They do a 50% cost sharing up to $2,500 if you hire one of their contractors. And this is certification that USA and all state recognizes proof of proper mitigation. State Farm uses it for renewals, not for adding new clients. Um, and they, they present to us last time, uh, we, we checked with them last week, that no insurer has denied coverage for a homeowner who, who has presented that certification. So it's very good news for those consumers. But it's a small program. It doesn't even cover the whole county. Nevada County, California, their Fire Safe Council, has two pieces. They have their advisory visit on defensible space. And so they're going to check compliance with a, our, our public resource code there. And that's that 100 feet of defensible space, 100 feet of defensible space, sorry. And then they'll provide grants for, for people who have financial need. Um, and so, and that's a very unique partnership where all state and insurers actually providing part of the dollars for those grants. Um, and then there's the defensible space verification service. And so they're coming back to see that they complied. Uh, because for insurance purposes, the insurer wants to know be, with that vegetation mitigation that it is ongoing, right? It's not a one and done. Replacing your vents, doing home hardening actions are a one and done or a one and done for many, many years. But for that vet vegetation management, that needs to be done at least annually. Um, and what we found with Nevada, Caddy, Nevada County, uh, the defensible space verification has usually been accepted as proof that they've done enough. Uh, but now we're starting to see denials. And as part of this, um, we were finding, just like with um, uh, the FireWise program and the, uh, the Boulder program, that the insurers are offering that 5% discount. Uh, but this is all, um, it's, not, it's not mandatory, it's voluntary, it's not uniform, and it's very much subject to change. Uh, this is just a chart we have. We spent, the, as I said, those three years um, when everybody was locked down with COVID working on this project, the Rep Resource Center. And these are the mitigations that we came up with that uh, the Department of Insurance did, CAL FIRE, and they also uh, align very closely with what IBHS rolled out last year in Paradise, California. This is the, far, the FireWise USA program. Um, it, this is where a community comes in and they're a recognized community. And so this, again, provides um, some discounts that are voluntary um, in, in their, um, it, for consumers. But it, it involves a larger process. It's not what an individual consumer is going to do. It's a larger effort. Um, and they have to do very specific FireWise actions for the year and get it approved, get their application approved. And so here are the discounts available on policies in the states that honor that. And you can see the years that they came into being. And so here are the problems and the potential solutions that we see. So these are all good examples of volunteer programs, but without legislation that mandates compliance is automatically eligible. Homeowners are, are can and are, mitigating all that they want, but it doesn't matter to insurers. That's what we're finding. So there's no reward for taking those steps to be a partner with the insurance company. Um, insurance commissioners needed increased oversight over the use of wildfire models that don't account for mitigation or local firefighting capacity, because we're seeing that that fire line score or core logic score is being presented as the sole underwriting criteria for these issues. And then going back to just overall the big picture, establishing uniform mitigation criteria just like with fortified homes that's accepted by all insurers so it's not Mickey Mouse across different states and different jurisdictions can help prevent market disruption. And so just to talk about fire, wildfire specifically, um, the, the pullbacks we're seeing feel very oversized compared to the damage. So between 2005 and June 2022, Headwater Economics reported that 97,000 homes, businesses, and other structures were destroyed by wildfires. The top 10 of those wildfires occurred in California, Tennessee, and Texas. And so just compare this to one hurricane in one year. Katrina, 850,000 homes damaged or destroyed. Sandy, 650,000 homes destroyed. So over 17 years, you're looking at less than 100,000 homes having been destroyed, but the market is reacting as if our stats are 
this is every year we're having these major disruptive events. And so just taking, keeping that in mind as you're thinking about mitigations. Um, and just about the uniform mitigation criteria, without that, insurers are gonna have no faith in the system. So setting a level playing field that consumers know where they're aiming to be so that insurers have faith that they are actually doing those steps that are realistic and follow science are gonna be key. And then this is my information and I'm gonna turn it over to our next presenter. Good morning, my name is Hilary Segura. I'm with the American Property Casuals Casualty Insurance Association. Uh, thank you for the time this morning. Um, I just wanna make, I'll keep my comments relatively brief. Um, I would say the, the key to improving insurance affordability and availability is by reducing overall losses. And insurance discounts can provide a helpful financial incentive, but the focus should not simply be on providing a discount. Insurance rates must accurately reflect the risk and be developed through sound actuarial standards of practice for the system to work properly and not result in harm to the, to the market. An effective insurance-based mitigation program must be carefully considered to ensure it incentivizes the right actions that ultimately benefit consumers and facilitates a healthy insurance marketplace. There are, in our view, there are three keys um, to an effective insurance-based mitigation incentive program. Um, First off, APCIA does oppose any sort of mandate. Um, so any program should be voluntary, flexible, and limited in scope. I would also say that laws and regulations should also be limited to residential property lines due to the complexity of large commercial line accounts. Um, second, it should be verifiable, grounded in science, and risk-based. Prescribed mitigation actions must scientifically demonstrate a reduction in risk with premium credits actually reflecting the actual live level of risk reduction. Discounts must be based on actuarially credible data and applied to actuarially supported premium components for the payroll. And third, um, any program must be cost effective, consistent, and complementary. Um, the costs and measures need to implement, needed to implement an insurance-based mitigation incentive program shouldn't be excessive, um, negating, thus negating any potential savings a mitigation program would provide for a consumer. It also should be consistent with any local codes and ordinances. Um, so insurance incentives help reinforce efforts of the state and local government officials and amplify other financial incentives. As Representative Jordan mentioned earlier, Louisiana did take steps hand-in-hand um, -hand with encouraging um, the discounts on insurance. The state did fund a program to incentivize um, residents to take steps to four to five and helped fund it. We would certainly encourage um, states while they're looking at uh, this proposal to also take a look at providing funding and incentives in grant form uh, to residents to take proactive um, actions. Um, APCIA has been a uh, proactive in this mitigation space, so we're looking forward to being a constructive partner with NCOIL as this proposal moves through the process. Good morning. Um, my name is Matt Overturf with the National Association of Mutual Insurance Companies. Uh, so to begin today's conversation, it's important to point out that insurers' core responsibility is to understand and mitigate or manage risk. Disaster mitigation is not a new issue for property casualty insurance, which, is, which since its inception has concentrated on extreme weather and focused on seeking ways to minimize the physical and financial effects of weather events on policyholders. From a pol public policy standpoint, the property casualty insurance industry has focused on extreme weather events for decades and has been working to advance resiliency policy and reduce the effects of weather events in the states and on Capitol Hill. Uh, with this in mind, however, NAMIC opposes the concept of mandatory discounts. Mandatory discounts effectively do little to mitigate risk. Uh, in order to effectively bend the risk curve, a broad adoption of comprehensive mitigation action is required. And state experience illustrates this. So looking across the states, states that have adopted only a mandatory discount have far fewer fortified designations 
then states that adopt a more comprehensive approach that includes grants, building code supplements, and tax deductions, for example. In addition, we are also concerned with the impact uh, mandatory discounts could have on innovation and comp uh, competition in the property insurance market. If all insurers are required to offer a discount, it is likely to look similar across the marketplace. Whereas a permissive approach would allow and encourage an insurer to offer programs in a given state to differentiate themselves among their competitors. And finally, we are concerned about the potential cost to implement such a program specifically on smaller insurers and in smaller states. It is this, this in mind that we oppose the including mandatory discount language in the model, but we do support the continued dialogue around disaster mitigation in a comprehensive manner. Um, and I'll just close by, you know, we've had several conversations with Representative Dunnigan and other members, and we look forward to continuing those conversations as, as we go forward. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, we'll start with any questions from legislators. Do we have Representative Tedford? Okay. Oh, okay, Mark Tedford, Oklahoma. Um, the question I would have as far as your comment on um, the, wild, the wildfires and uh, the, da the damage. I, I think the reason why the industry uh, looks at wildfires differently than uh, the hurricanes is because uh, the wind pools in those states bore the brunt of it. Um, so, uh, what I was going to question is ask is uh, in California with the fair plan, there's been consideration to develop a market around the fair plan, like some of the states, uh, the coastal states have done, to where you're buying an insurance product that excludes the, the peril that's the problem and then just buying that peril from. Uh, the pool in that state. Is that is a model being considered for that in California? Yeah, so with the California Fair Plan, uh, what we have are difference in conditions policies where you can add those additional perils. perils. And like I said, currently the California Fair Plan is only about 300,000 policies. Most people in the state are able to find insurance elsewhere. So it's, it's not that it's a... Um, a huge risk that, 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 that there are a lot of people being impacted by it currently, but as the market tightens, it, they're going to see more business, right? And so there's that piece. Uh, but you know, the, the reason I brought up the, the, the hurricanes is just the scale. When I talk to people about wildfire risk, in their head they're equating it with, you have you know, a campfire every, every fire is a campfire, right? You're looking at 18 to 20,000 homes destroyed. That's not the case. And so putting it in perspective is, is helpful to look at the scale of the disasters that actually happen. Because it's not a lot of people impacted overall, but it's having a very outsized impact in areas that are most likely will not face a wildfire. And I'm not gonna say will not because we all saw Malibu burned all the way to the Pacific Ocean in 2018. Does that answer your question? All right, Representative Ferguson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I know, do you have any data that uh, versus a discount, and I know in Arkansas we have a loan mitigation program. Do you have any data on whether the discount is more effective or the loan program is more effective in terms of participation? Um, I mean, just taking from, so IBHS has a list, they obviously keep who, the fortified designations in each state. So looking at those, I mean, states where it's just a mandatory discount, they have a far fewer number. I mean, Oklahoma, for example, has 17 fortified designations in the entire state. They've had a mandatory discount for six or seven years. Whereas Alabama has a more comprehensive program that includes grants and some of those other things, and they have over 41,000 designations in the state. And I'll add for a wildfire because it's not mandatory in California that you get the discount. So for California, we have a lot of utilities because utilities sometimes are causing the fires. Um, and a lot of jurisdictions that have invested very heavily in grants and low programs for mitigation. And those homeowners, when they take those steps, then are still often dropped because they're in those, those wildfire risk areas that are very high severity. And so you've got people who are taking the steps and then not able to get insurance. So from their perspective, having the guarantee of if I take these steps and I take advantage of these loan programs, if I can retain my insurance, because again, it's affordability and accessibility, right? So in California, it's a little different that we're looking at accessibility is just a, as big an issue as affordability. 
May I ask a follow-up? Is it? Yeah. Uh, I guess my other question is in these state, because my, my daughter lives in California and her insurance after the fire went from 4,000 a month to 13,000 a month and 6,000 of that is fair fire. Uh, what about people who have mortgages on their house? Are the bankers still requiring them to have homeowner's insurance if it's Oh, that? yeah, yeah. And we're working, um, just, just to be frank, uh, for United Policyholders, we've been meeting with Fannie Mae for a couple of years now working on what that looks like and how that impacts the market. Um, and actually just finished a white paper project with them on manufactured home insurance because that's a different animal, but with wildfires is um, incredibly not helpful as far as giving people the tools they need to recover. Okay, thank you. Representative Masters. Thank you. So I haven't delved deeply into property casualty, but I'm certainly interested in, in your views here. And, and I'm trying to understand the f argument we're framing or the discussion we're framing, and one is between either a mandate on the insurance companies in terms of Get offering discounts and providing preventative measures for fire and casualty, for property casualty damage, whether it be for fires or for hurricanes, et cetera. The second is whether or not we as legislators should be looking at mandating practices for homeowners for that same issue. That seems to be part of the argument. And I'm wondering, I want to have that discussion. And the second question is in terms of if we're having trouble with access to insurance, does that become a legislative issue in terms of where we mandate the level of coverage or the pooling for a certain catastrophic uh, insurance? Because if you've got hyper-local risks of fires, do you subsidize that with an assessment on the general pool? And those are the questions. So for the second piece, I would actually defer to our ED, who I believe is going to be presenting in, uh, at your, one of your upcoming meetings, because that's that's more, I, I, I'm, I, while I know a little bit about property and casualty, I'm long-term recovery and wildfire stuff. I've been doing that for 15 years, so I know this piece for the consumers very intimately. That piece is uh, above my pay grade, to be quite honest. Um, but I will say... Um, if you notice our presentation, we didn't make a recommendation on what to do because it needs to be a, a very collaborative to us, a very collaborative process to figure out what's going to work in your state. But having that framework that has uniform standards, consistency, at least in your state so that insurers know what the playbook is, your consumers do, pairing that with um, you, know, you as legislators looking at providing those grant pools, getting those FEMA grants, and then doing matches to make that work to help consumers do that, I think are going to be very key to what you're doing. But again, if you do those mitigations, and I say this, I met a gentleman who did $75,000 worth of repairs two weeks ago. He, 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 he replaced the vents in his house. He put a Class A roof on. He did all of these things to meet what the state standards by the California Fire Department are. So that he and it matches what IBHS requires for. Um, so he, he met the standards for the new home construction in California. He met IBHS standards because he, he's looking at that saying, okay, I'm doing everything the science says I can do, including the insurance company's research body says I can do to mitigate wildfire risk. He was still dropped. And so his resource is to go to the California Fair Plan, which is just fire, and then you have to add your additional, your living expenses, your contents, um, any of those other coverages are not included. You have to add all of those on, and it adds up really quickly. I have a consumer two months ago who gave me $36,000 policy per year. They can't afford it. And remember, you know, for people who have a mortgage, they don't have an option not to have it. And if they don't, they're going to get a forced lien policy that is the bare bones policy that just covers the loan. They cannot rebuild. They've lost all the equity they've put in that house over years. They have no ALA. They have no contents coverage, no liability. So they're, they're, they're stuck. And so what do they do? And that's one of the reasons why the, the lenders are looking at this issue. We've met with the Fed, the Treasury on these issues. And everybody's concerned because if we can't come up with a solution, it's going to impact the larger financial market in the, in the country. I'll just add really quick on, on wildfires from our perspective. Um, it's probably the most unique of these disasters that we talk about because when it comes to, you know, wind and hail, 
you can mitigate your own individual property and, and that can help you, right? When it comes to wildfire, it is much more from a community-wide, you know, you can do things to your individual property, but over at the end of the day to really make that impact, you have to kind of go from the top down, bottom up, whatever it is, from a community across the board. You know, you could do whatever you do to your house in a wildfire, but if your neighbor's done nothing, you might be a little bit protected, but still there's still gonna be, you know, a higher risk of, of damage and, um, you know, negative consequences to you, even though you've done what, what you can do, you kind of have to look around you as well. And then one final thing to throw on the, the uniqueness of wildfire. In most other disasters that we're talking about, these, these risks that you can mitigate, it's more expensive. Wildfire recovery is more expensive because that insurance policy is not looking at you've got to replace that, that foundation. There, there are unique costs related to a total loss with a wildfire that you're not seeing in most other disaster insurance claims. And so preventing those houses from burning down to the ground is incredibly helpful to everyone involved, the insurers, all of us. All right, are there any other questions or comments? All right, if there are no other questions or comments, then I certainly want to thank our speakers uh, for taking time to come and educate us on that. Uh, if there are any other questions or comments in the future, please reach out to Representative Donegan, myself, or anyone from the NCOIL staff. With that, next on our agenda is the introduction and discussion of the NCOIL Catalytic Converter Theft Prevention Model Act a model that I'm jointly sponsoring with my good friend, Texas Representative Tom Oliverson, in calls Vice President. You can view the model on page 346 of your binders and on the website and the app. And as a reminder, we had an introductory presentation on the issue at our last meeting in March, and uh, we're now proceeding with the development of the Model Act. I think it's a good issue for NCOR to get involved with I can tell you uh, in my home state of Louisiana, we have had some issues with this and we have uh, tried to address it with some legislation. But uh, although we've done that, a couple of months ago, some data was released showing that Louisiana's had a near 3,000% increase in catalytic uh, converted thefts since 2019. So I'm not sure how effective we've actually been. It's, it's one that we're continue, continuing to address. Um, but with that being said, Representative Oliverson, do you have any comments? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and it is an honor to, to work with you again, my good friend, to, to work on some good policy here. Um, in my home state, uh, Texas actually is ranked number two nationally in terms of the total numbers of catalytic converter thefts occurring annually. So. Uh, this was brought to a head in our state uh, with the tragic and untimely death of Harris County Sheriff's Deputy um, Darren Almendarez, who was gunned down in a grocery store parking lot by three men who were attempting to steal the catalytic converter from his personal vehicle. Uh, Texas recently passed a law uh, very similar to the Model Act, which uh, essentially not only increases the penalty for theft of a catalytic converter to a felony, but also allows district attorneys to prosecute offenders under the organized crime statutes. Um, and so I, I think, you know, this is obviously a serious problem. Uh, this is a high number of claims. It's leading to a tragic loss of life. And so I'm honored to work with you on this. I would throw out one other interesting tidbit, and that is that uh, in my home county, having recently visited with the uh, chief of police for our third largest school district, which was about almost 200,000 students and close to 100 campuses, they, when they actually apprehended uh, one of these catalytic converter theft uh, rings in one of the high school parking lots, they ran into an issue where the district attorney decided that because it was a property crime and they had bigger priorities, even though they'd sort of, quote, caught the main guy, red-handed, uh, they did, did decide not to accept the charges. Uh, and so one of the other things that, that may be of interest to you in your states, just depending on your appetite for this, in Texas we recently passed House Bill 17, which added to the list of 
reasons why a district attorney could be removed from office through a judicial process and unwillingness either publicly expressed or through matter of policy to refuse to prosecute entire categories of criminal activity. So um, sometimes you need the carrot and sometimes you need the stick. Uh, but it's an honor to work with you on this, my friend. Again, thank you, Representative Oliverson. Uh, with us here today, we have Pat Martin of the National Insurance Crime Bureau and Nick Steingart of the Alliance for Automotive Innovation. Again, we'll hold questions until everyone is finished, and we'll start with Pat. Thank you, Chairman Jordan, and thank you, Representative Oliverson, for co-sponsoring this really important model legislation. Uh, my name is Pat Martin again. I'm with the National Insurance Crime Bureau. Very pleased to be here with my colleague, uh, Eric uh, DeCampos, who you've heard from before. Eric is the brains behind the operation. So uh, in this presentation, what I'd like to do is just touch on um, what Eric covered in the last meeting, but also go into in a little bit more detail the model legislation, and then also answer any questions you may have. Uh, we know that a lot of your jurisdictions have either considered or are continuing to consider legislation, either new or enhancements to existing legislation in your jurisdictions to address this important problem. And we think the model legislation, as the co-sponsors have said, goes a long way to giving your jurisdictions some additional tools to deal with this very uh, devastating problem. So just in terms of background, um, not news to anyone here, there's an explosion in this type of theft uh, since 2016, really 2019. It's gone up 1,200% since 2019. What that means in terms of numbers is, as reported to the National Insurance Crime Bureau, my organization, shoot through really the claims process, we have access to claims as to catalytic converter thefts. Um, it's over 110 thousand thefts that were reported and that's really we don't know uh, whether uh, that represents a majority or just a portion of the theft problem because not all thefts are being reported obviously uh, some consumers victims of this crime are not reporting them because they don't want it to be part of their insurance claims history which may impact their premium so we think it's a much more significant problem but what we can tell this body is in uh, of those 110,000 uh, theft since 2016. About two-thirds of those have occurred in 2021 and 2022, and we don't have the numbers yet for 2023. So the problem is not going away, and if anything, it's going up. Um, the other thing we can say with certainty is that the consumer impact is significant. So your constituents are out there. Um, they need their vehicles, obviously, to go to work, bring their kids to school, go to extra events, to just to live life. And when a converter is stolen from their vehicle, it can take weeks, sometimes months, to get that vehicle repaired. So this is a significant quality of life issue that goes well beyond just the loss of the value of the catalytic converter. Because the cost to make a person whole um, sometimes can't be captured in terms of lost time at work, in terms of inability to bring their children to school, uh, or to have to arrange for alternative methods, or um, for uh, the, you know, the cost to the industry, the insurance industry as well, in terms of getting their insured, their policyholders back to whole. So the impact can be fairly um, devastating in some instances, uh, not to mention sometimes these catalytic converter threats lead to violence, as Representative Oliverson mentioned. And I think as was mentioned by my colleague um, in the previous session where it resulted in a law enforcement officer who is trying to prevent a theft a dying at the hands of these um, criminal actors. So uh, it's a significant issue, and we're glad to see that many of the states are interested in addressing it. We'd just like to help with our co-sponsors here. Um, you have tools to bring back to your legislative bodies to enhance the ability to address this very significant problem. I'm not going to cover what a cattle converter is. Um, but uh, if you have any questions regarding that, because you weren't here for the last session, please just direct them to me either in the open session or after the session. So very quickly on this, this is just to represent that the states have taken action on this, both in the past and more recently in 2022 and 2023. You'll see that the majority of uh, the activity occurred in 2022 and 2023 to address the increasing threat of the crime and impact of the crime. Um, in the last several years. 
what this is also supposed to represent is the variety of ways in which states have addressed this either in short form or long form, either in like um, some ways, uh, maybe not comprehensive ways, consistent with the uh, model legislation that's being proposed. And so there's a lot of variety out there in terms of how it's being addressed. And importantly, the criminal rings that deal in this fairly lucrative crime, they don't operate, of course, within uh, state borders. So a lot of this is multi-district, and oftentimes, even though the thefts occur in one place, perhaps the sales occur in other places, because in those states, um, there are not as many restrictions on buying and selling catalytic converters. And so the bad actors are smart, and they're going to limit their exposure, and the patchwork of laws across the United States makes it easier for these criminal rings to operate. So one of the efforts here with the model legislation is to bring everybody up to the same level of preventative and deterrent uh, care through this model legislation, and to the extent the uniform model bill can be adopted in large part across the many states, it will make uh, law enforcement's response to this crime uh, more effective. Um, we'll cover these. Basically, there's been four themes to addressing this problem, either new or enhanced criminal statutes, scrapyard regulations, record-keeping type regulations, uh, to make those transactions a little bit stickier so that um, law enforcement and other regulatory bodies after the fact can get the information they need um, as to whether a seller or buyer is a legitimate seller or buyer or is involved in some unlawful activity, buyer-seller restrictions, um, including identifying you know, where the vehicle, uh, the catalytic converter was recovered from um, or taken off of. And then in some instances, including Texas, um, presumption of guilt or really inferences of criminal intent, which is sometimes hard to establish. Um, just real briefly on the federal response, it's become such an issue that um, a representative of Indiana, Representative Baird, has um, introduced a bill that would provide for a unified response across the United States. And it includes certain themes that I uh, discussed on that previous slide and are in the model bill. I'm not going to go into great depth here, um, honestly, because even though it's been introduced and there is a lot of support for it on the House side and the Senate side, Senator Klobuchar of Minnesota and another senator, and I forget that person's name at this time, has had a sister bill in the Senate, it just is not uh, getting a ton of traction right now. And as goes with many things, um, the federal government is probably going to address it after many of the states have. Um, so it's really incumbent upon this body and the state legislators to take action in order to curb and deter this problem. Um, real quick, and this is where I want to spend a little bit of the time here, is we have four different buckets or themes for the model overview which I'll go through and please ask any questions as we go. Now, only one component of it is really to enhance the criminal um, penalties. Um, for some states, a, a new statute is required, but for most states, it is an enhancement. Uh, many of the states for property crimes, not surprisingly, will have a threshold amount that uh, differentiates between a misdemeanor offense and a felony offense. Um, the model legislation would make the theft of a catalytic converter a felony offense, and that's important. Um, for reasons similar to what Representative Oliverson uh, alluded to, which is when prosecutors, law enforcement are trying to decide where to dedicate their resources, um, they are seeking to follow what legislators are deeming to be more significant crimes. Clearly, when you identify a crime as being punishable as a felony, legislatures are saying this is a more significant crime and you should uh, prioritize that over misdemeanor offenses. So making it a felony offense is an important uh, move for many states, um, not only for uh, the thieves, but also, as you see there below, for receiving stolen catalytic converters. In many jurisdictions, receipt of stolen property is a misdemeanor offense, or there are less penalties associated with that. By bringing the receipt of uh, stolen catalytic converters up to uh, the same level of punishment as the seller, um, the unlawful seller, uh, allows for greater enforcement mechanisms and increases and enhances the importance of uh, the enforcement mechanism. There's also an aggravated theft uh, provision in the model legislation for repeat offenders and those uh, individuals who committed uh, the theft while armed.
The model legislation would also provide for limitations for certain uh, on buyers and sellers. I'm not going to spend much time on buyers. It's typically uh, record keeping um, restrictions as well as identifying um, the seller and requiring putting some onus on the buyers so that the buyers can't claim to be unwitting uh, recipients of these catalytic, stolen catalytic converters. Where a lot of the action takes place in the model uh, legislation is on the sellers. Um, there is a bevy of different types of provisions that can require um, certain additional record uh, keeping requirements of the sellers, some verification requirements on sellers that they be licensed um, or um, otherwise registered to be able to sell catalytic converters. Uh, that can occur with existing uh, regulatory requirements, but also a certain stickiness on, for example, uh, the sales. Um, not on this slide, but one of the proposed provisions as a limitation on sellers that not be allowed to be sell, sold to individuals under the age of 18. Why is that? So that um, bad actors are not using juveniles um, to commit their crimes. Um, there's also a restriction, proposed restriction, in terms of regular business hours. So sales occurring in the dark of night, you know, after 9 p.m., before 6 a.m., when some of the nefarious activity may occur, trying to bring this back into the transparency of daylight and regular business hours. Other things that uh, seek to regulate sellers so that it becomes more of a regular uh, business uh, that can be regulated and also for law enforcement after the fact um, when they're looking at this they can hold you know non-compliant sellers uh, responsible and then finally and we think as important a part of the program as any is a uh, etching program so previously I showed the federal uh, legislation and it call it includes a stamping program there's just a small difference between stamping and etching many of you may be aware of this stamping is more of like a typeface um, requires certain uh, specific uh, machinery to do mostly mostly with manufacturers you can get it elsewhere but mostly with manufacturers etching would allow uh, for ease of execution on this there are etching tools um, that can be used to etch in the VIN number on these catalytic converters. It's much easier for regulators and law enforcement to track illegal converter sales and illegal activity if there's a way to identify the actual part. And so part numbers and uh, VIN numbers etched on the actual catalytic converters, uh, sometimes with the, the anti-theft uh, spray, spray paint, uh, can be a very, very effective tool for law enforcement after the fact when they're trying to identify bad actors. And importantly, this would not be funded by um, appropriations, it'd be funded by fines coming out of violations of these offenses. So it would be a self-funding um, type uh, program um, and it would allow for any number of individuals and entities to um, provide for the etching service. I know NICB is actively involved in this area. Uh, we just do it as part of one of our many services we provide the public and our members and work with law enforcement co closely to do this on Saturdays. And it's not actually that surprising how many consumers are willing to take a little bit of time out of their schedules to come in and get their catalytic converter etched um, so that when uh, some bad actor gets underneath that vehicle and looks up and sees uh, the etching, decides, hey, path of least resistant, I'm just going to go to the next house. You know, it doesn't take long to remove a catalytic converter. It can be less than two minutes if you have the right tools. And so um, it is actually a fairly effective, we believe, deterrent uh, to would-be thieves of a catalytic converter to see that there is actually some identification on the catalytic converter that they're thinking about stealing. So that is it. I probably went a little bit long, but open any questions to try to help you all uh, discuss openly the issue and consider the model legislation. Senator Ellis. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I have a question uh, in a particular scenario. Uh, I'm always aware of unintended consequences to legislation. So in making the buyer of a stolen catalytic converter subject to felony uh, penalties, if you have a legitimate buyer, legitimate business, what responsibilities will they have to verify that a seller is legitimate also? I mean, someone with our modern uh, printed techniques can 
and computer knowledge can easily ver uh, forge and make their documents look like they are real. So how would you address that particular scenario? What type of responsibility would the buyer have to uh, do due diligence and deal with the seller? Yeah, it's a great question because it's harder on that side of the equation, right? For sellers, uh, folks who have ongoing business and some who are, most who are licensed or regulated already by the state, it's gonna be easier for them because they have existing systems. On the buyer side, uh, maybe it's a one-off buyer or maybe it's a scrap dealer, it may be any numbers, but the uh, suggested buyer restrictions would be a validation that you have a, uh, a business that is licensed or regulated, and most of that can occur through open source, right? You can go on the internet and you can see where a particular individual or entity is licensed with this state to conduct that type of uh, business. Uh, also, um, there is a, the, the, the seller under the model legislation is required to provide the purchaser with certain validation documentation. So the buyer should also be receiving that documentation, and that includes like a valid ID, maybe proof of their um, licensure, also uh, information regarding where the catalytic converter came from. So it's a very uh, appropriate question to ask, how much are we gonna actually require of our buyers and how much will they actually do? But I think in combination with the seller restrictions and the transaction documentation that go to the buyer, and then the buyer's kind of a minimal requirements to make sure that they have a legitimate seller, um, it, it provides some mechanisms to put some onus on the buyer as well. We'll move on to Nick and then we'll take questions at the end. All right, good morning. Uh, my name is Nick Steingart. I'm with the Alliance for Automotive Innovation. Uh, if you're not familiar with our association, uh, we go by Auto Innovators for short to save you some syllables. Uh, we uh, represent the manufacturers that produce never, nearly every vehicle, uh, new vehicle sold in the United States on an annual basis. Um, we heard from NICB both in San Diego and now, and uh, so I won't rehash sort of the issue and, and the trend and what's causing the uptick in catalytic converter thefts. I think they have uh, very thoroughly uh, explained uh, why there has been this increase over the last couple of years. Um, obviously, this is an issue that's touched uh, and hit the uh, automotive industry and consumers hard over the last couple of years, so we're glad to see Encoil working on the model bill. Uh, my comments are, are relatively brief. Um, we think, by and large, this is a, a fantastic model. Um, I would urge a bit of caution against the VIM marking program at the final, uh, in the final section of the bill. Now, we understand this is voluntary, so there's no mandate or requirement of consumers to have their catalytic converter, uh, you know, etched or stamped or marked, whatever uh, method you want to <coughs> um, uh, use. But in our experience, it's potentially a, a, a costly program that delivers negligible returns. Uh, and that's for a couple of reasons. One, if your catalytic converter uh, is stolen, it doesn't really do you any good if, uh, if it was uh, marked or etched or stamped. Uh, your vehicle is virtually undrivable, if not illegal in most places. Uh, uh, and uh, thieves can simply uh, deface or scratch off the etching without uh, damaging the valuable parts of the catalytic converter, which are on the inside of the part. Uh, two, we don't think it serves as a really meaningful deterrent if, you know, let's say in a generous scenario, one out of every, let's say, 100 vehicles is um, stamped with a, with a VIN or a tracking or a serial number. Um, it might, on an individual basis, save you from having your converter stolen, but is it going to make a widespread Imp uh, impact if a thief knows he could just slide under, you know, the, the car next door and steal that converter? Maybe not. You know, we think that the, the best way to uh, target these uh, thefts is by uh, cutting off the illegal market, which, uh, you know, the rest of this bill does a good job of doing with those uh, uh, limitations and, and restrictions on uh, purchasing and selling of catalytic converters. So. Um, there, there are a lot of layers in the model bill that we think do serve as a good 
uh, meaningful widespread deterrent to uh, crack down on these catalytic converter thefts. Um, and we think that's the best way to, to target this illegal market by going after those unsavory um, actors who, who might be purchasing and, and reselling these converters uh, for the content. So, as I mentioned, I, I think uh, 95 plus percent of this bill we completely agree with and, and uh, is in line with legislation that we've supported in the states over the past couple of years. Um, and uh, focus on those chain of custody requirements and those record keeping requirements. Um, so we're, we're happy to, to see NCOIL and, and pleased and thank you Chair Jordan and Dr. Oliverson for, for bringing the model forward. Um, we think it's um, a, certainly a step in the right direction. You know, there's uh, by our count 40 plus states that have dealt with this in some way, shape or form and this is a really good comprehensive way to, uh, to address this issue. And that was all I had, thank you. Thank you. All right, do we have any other questions? Oh, Representative Wood, I'm sorry, I didn't see. Hi, thank you. Um, as an insurance legislator, uh, I just, my question is really to our colleagues here. So your catalytic converter gets stolen, and what I have been hearing is that uh, people are paying five and six hundred bucks out of pocket to get their cars back online. So what are we, what model language regarding insurance or what have you done in your districts to kind of help people get back in their, get their cars up and running? Uh, my colleague is um, um, an attorney. One of her um, constituents, um, catalytic converters was stolen and the insurer uh, deemed it as a total loss. So we can do all these things to, you know, make the penalties more uh, tougher, try to go after the um, illegal industry, but on the insurance side, how are we helping our constituents get to work, you know, as soon as possible without having to pay all this out of pocket if you're, you know, experiencing this crime? I don't think there's a clean answer to that. Um, I think that, uh, it, it's a tough question. Uh, the reality is, is just as you said, which is when a consumer has a catalytic converter stolen, they have a couple options to just um, take it into an uh, automobile dealer and try to get the part replaced at ex extensive cost, which is probably not really an option, or to make a claim insurance and then potentially impact their premiums somewhere down the line because every claim will ultimately uh, find its way back into a premium somewhere down the line, right? We know that. So there isn't, I don't think, a really uh, great answer, at least from our perspective, and we're focused, of course, on the, uh, the enforcement side um, of how the insurance industry can uh, make the issue a little bit easier. Um, those deductibles can be significant, 250 to 500, um, and then getting it back online line still takes many, many weeks, although the insurance industry, from my understanding, has been pretty good about when a vehicle goes down, if the coverages are there, providing rental vehicle and other uh, means of getting around. But I, I don't think from my position I can add much to your question. Representative Owls. Yeah, it's, it's a really good question, actually. Um, I, I would say, at least from what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing in, in our home state, the the real issue right now isn't the ability of, of uh, the policy to cover that as a, as a loss. Um, I think the sticking point, at least in Texas right now, is that it takes about literally 15 seconds for them to steal the catalytic converter by you know sliding under the vehicle, getting the sawzall, cutting it off, and they're gone. Um, and unfortunately, because of, you know, I'm sure everybody's heard this a thousand times, but because of supply chain problems, um, consumers are finding it difficult to get that catalytic converter replaced in a timely fashion. And so I can't speak to the individual situation of having the car totaled, but I, I know my office has heard from auto dealers and from consumers alike that the, the actual getting the vehicle back on the road is a lengthy process, mostly due to lack of, of supplies. Because you know, these devices have a certain amount of rare minerals in them that uh, are metals that, and that's the reason they're stealing them. So, I mean, that's, I'm just telling you what we've seen. So I think it's more on the supply side 
Um, one of the other things that we've seen, uh, fortunately, is that a, a growing number of auto dealers, particularly cars and uh, trucks, I think in, in Texas, at least the one that everyone knows about is the, the large Toyota truck, the Tundra, uh, which actually has two catalytic converters. That, that's sort of a gold mine for a, for a thief. And so what the dealers are doing a lot of times is prophylactically before they sell a vehicle, they're installing these metal cages on the underside, which don't make it impossible to steal, uh, but makes it to where, um, you know, somebody goes under the vehicle, sees the cage there. Now it's going to take five minutes to remove it, just move on to the next vehicle. So it serves as a bit of a deterrent. Uh, and so we're starting to see that happen a lot where dealers are either doing that as part of a dealer charge for the vehicle, putting the cage on, or they're talking to you when you purchase a vehicle and saying, would you like us to, to add that? It's, you know, $150 or $200 for us to get under the vehicle and put this theft deterrent device on. So kind of like putting a security system on your car, I guess. I agree with Representative Vallis, and I think that's a great question, but in the interest of time, I certainly talked to Representative Wood offline. Um, we're going to briefly take two questions from Representative Lilly and then Representative Bennett, and then we're going to move on to our next topic. So, Representative Lilly first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry. Two questions. Um, is there a study or profile of these bad actors who are taking um, this, these catalytic converters? And then two, have we, have you heard that this would be, this type of program would be somewhat of a penalty enhancement um, issue in some states that are trying to get away from that? So I think the short answer, at least in my knowledge, is no to your first question. Um, I think it's a crime of opportunity based on what we've seen, and all types of criminals are just seeing this as, a, as an easy, quick way to make money. If it takes less than two minutes um, to remove a catalytic converter and the uh, rare metals within them can be sold for even $500, $600 per pop, it's a pretty uh, lucrative way of doing things, and it doesn't take a high deal of skill, right? Um, so. It literally takes a reciprocating saw and your willingness to go underneath the car, jack it up, and remove the catalytic converter, sometimes not even jack it up. So it's just kind of a very low resistance crime. So uh, in terms, I, I think what we've found in, uh, in terms of those who've been caught, um, it fills the gamut of bad actors. Um, I don't think there's a, a profile for that necessarily. It's just crime opportunity. Um, and then uh, I'm trying to remember your second question any conversation around this type of model yeah. being considered a penalty enhancement? Yeah, um, so we haven't, uh, I don't think, um, received direct outreach from legislators saying, hey, our legislative body is really against uh, increases, enhancements to criminal penalties across the board, but we're aware of it, uh, certainly, and I think you as a legislator and other legislators are very much aware of various jurisdictions trying to get away from um, just enhancing penalties without covering the other side of the house. And so um, we're sensitive to that. Um, and ultimately, it would be a matter of enforcement as well, uh, right? So it does give additional tools to law enforcement, but um, they still have to make the decision to dedicate resources towards it and avail themselves of those tools and potential enhancements through sentencing. Um, so I think it's more of expand the toolbox uh, versus dictating, mandating that they enforce in that way. And so certain jurisdictions would probably take advantage of it. Certain jurisdictions would not, I'm sure. All right. Mr. Gotta, Chairman, one follow-up. No, no we got we to follow We got to move on to the next one. You can, you can talk offline. I apologize on that, but in an interest of time, Representative Bennett, quickly. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Get over. Uh, Representative Woods, comments made me think about this from a consumer constituent standpoint um, I mean we're, we're trying to cut down on the instances of theft but on the other end of it if a catalytic converter is stolen and a claim is filed you know as an insurance agent I 
we always have to decide whether the claim is worth the, per, the, per, uh, the chance of, of their rate going up. So do we have any protections for consumers as far as if their catalytic converter is stolen, any assurances that their auto rates are not going to increase at a time when they're already increasing? And I, I don't know if we've already had this conversation, I just wasn't here for it, but that's just something that her comments sparked for me. Uh, thank you for the question. There's nothing in the model bill that would address that aspect of the potential third, fourth uh, order of events or consequences should, you know, somebody make a claim on a stolen cattle converter. Representative Lehman has an answer to that. I think he told me a quick answer to that. Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief. I think I can answer your question, uh, Representative Bennett. Um, when a claim is filed, normally this would be a theft claim, this would be a comprehensive claim. Comprehensive claims do not normally count against you from a law standpoint. Uh, what you see is, is not so much, do uh, you see frequency could be a problem. If I have a catalytic converter stolen 18 times in a row, there's gonna be a problem with my carrier. But one claim, I lose my converter, that claim's not gonna affect my premium. I, I'd say no carrier would really have an adverse effect. The bigger issue goes to the question on, on coverage, and that is, it is a comp claim, and there's a lot of people who do not carry physical damage on their vehicle, so they're out completely. I, know there's no, I don't think there's really a way to fix that. That's their decision. But to your point of was it going to affect the claim, the answer is no. All right. Um, this is not our final discussion on this, so uh, we certainly have time to develop the act and to take comments. Uh, I think the questions from, from Representative Wood, Representative Lilly, and others are great. Um, so if you have any questions on the topic, uh, if you want to provide any information, you can please reach out to, to me or Representative Oliverson or the NCOIL staff, and uh, we look forward to further in the discussion. Thank you again, gentlemen, for joining us. We'll move on to the next topic on our agenda, and that's the uh, introduction and discussion of the NCOIL pu Public Adjuster Professional Standards Reform Model Act sponsored by Kentucky Representative uh, Michael Meredith and co-sponsored by Indiana Representative and our immediate past president, Matt Lehman. You can view that model, excuse me, on page 327 of your binders and again on the website and the app. Rep uh, Representative Meredith is going to make some remarks during the presentations. So I'll recognize Representative Lehman now if he wants to make any remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate the opportunity to bring this model act today, working alongside Representative Lehman. Uh, this is representative of a bill we passed in Kentucky this year uh, with a couple of minor changes that came from the Indiana model that they passed as well. Uh, and so at this time, I will turn it over to Ms. Anne Marie Franklin to start the presentation uh, on our side. No, we're gonna, Representative Lehman, do you wanna comment? Ditto. Good enough. <laughs> we'll move on. All right. Um, we'll hear from my speakers. And, and again, we're going to start with uh, Ms. Anne Marie Franklin of Kentucky Foreign Bureau. And again, we'll hold all questions until all the speakers are finished. Thank you. Um, Anne Marie Franklin, Governmental Affairs Manager, Kentucky Farm Bureau Insurance. I uh, just want to give you all a little bit of background on why this bill was important to us in Kentucky, a little bit of the background of even where it came from. So as most of you know, um, over the last 18 months, Kentucky has been hit time and time again with natural disasters. It started in December 2021 when the western portion of our state was ravaged by tornadoes. Um, Representative Meredith's district was impacted, as was Representative um, Pollux that are with us today. Many of you probably saw on the news the, the tornado that hit Mayfield, uh, but the damage didn't stop there. It spread from the very western portion of the state all the way up into the south central portion of the state. Uh, many counties impacted, many insureds impacted. This happened in the middle of the night. The next day, we had, I, I can say our governor was boots on the ground immediately. Many of our folks in the General Assembly were out checking on their constituents. We had our congressmen from D.C. were in town and, and on the ground the very next morning. But more importantly, our insurers were on the ground. We had independent agents out checking on their people. Our CEO was out checking on our insureds. Um, 
it was it was an all-in approach from everybody in the state of Kentucky and then that continued on into July of 2022 when Eastern Kentucky was flooded um, inundated with the water again everybody came out everybody was helping flood insurance is a different story in that part of the state than than the coverage that was able to be applied in the western portion of the state but we were all in again um, with that uh, came some some new things to Kentucky some things that we hadn't really experienced before um, some background we adopted portions of the NAIC public adjuster model uh, to license public adjusters in the state of Kentucky there weren't guardrails uh, really put into place there were no real um, regulations around some things we only had 22 uh, residential public adjusters according to our Department of Insurance back in February February of 2023 since the bill passed in Kentucky we have gained one uh, licensed residential public adjuster um, and we work with them all the time at Kentucky Farm Bureau uh, I know a lot of other insurance companies work with them as well um, but the problem wasn't necessarily that we had very few public adjusters the concern came that we don't have very many um, but we got inundated with public adjusters from outside of our state that weren't necessarily familiar with our people and our people weren't familiar with them uh, we also had a again a wide range of western Kentucky a wide range of eastern Kentucky uh, filled with vulnerable consumers who had just lost everything they had in the east everything was gone in the west everything was gone um, so just to kind of cover a little bit about how our statute reads as defines public adjusters they are hired by the insurer uh, they are not hired by an insurance company they don't represent the company they represent the insured in resolving the claim uh, they do have a contract that is signed typically um, the contract will outline you know the compensation things of that nature public adjusters are the only adjusters who can receive compensation from an insurance settlement so your staff adjusters and independent adjusters represent an insurance company and are paid by the insurance company and they do not receive any funds from the insurance settlement that is paid to the insured um, to make repairs or rebuild their homes uh, so some concerns that came from that following the, over the last 18 months um, in Western Kentucky as I mentioned we were boots on the ground the very next day um, it happened in the middle of the night a lot of folks didn't know what they had lost a lot of folks didn't know what they had left and um, in, in talking about some of these concerns that our insureds had brought to us that our claims staff uh, we are very fortunate Kentucky Farm Bureau we have 14 uh, claims offices around the state and a, a large number of staff adjusters were very much grassroots oriented um, people were coming to us with lots of questions around the public adjuster realm we so we we started educating folks talked to the Department of Insurance uh, she also shared some stories with us of, of things that had come up and I, I will share one of those with you today uh, we had an insured who got up the next morning was looking at her at the damages and a vehicle pulled up out front of her home um, a truck and there was a magnet sticker on the door that said insurance adjuster that's all it said and uh, this individual got out and was sharing you know was empathetic to her situation was talking to her offered to help her resolve her claim and I think that intent was very much there and I know they'll share with you that that is their intent and that can be helpful uh, but in this situation she was vulnerable uh, she signed a contract on an iPad that she couldn't really she didn't have time to review she probably wasn't really in the mental state to review a contract um, when she got her insurance settlement check 35% of her money was gone and she could no longer rebuild her home because in that contract that public adjuster took his compensation was 35% of the total insurance settlement in that moment I don't know of an insurance company that wasn't paying limits on everything in Western Kentucky following those tornadoes 
Some may say it was justified and it was needed. That insured wasn't truly aware. There was, she didn't receive a copy of that contract to even go back on. There was nothing our Department of Insurance could do. Um, so that's where this came into play. And, and we were very stern in the, to not charge an unreasonable fee. You know, that insurer felt 35% was unreasonable um, to file a few papers because she was gonna get her limits paid anyway. Um, so that hits the, um, the percentage of, compens of compensation uh, paid from the claim settlement, the transparency portion. Um, we didn't get a copy of the contract. Her insurance company didn't get a copy of the contract. It's typically we get a phone call from a public adjuster that says, I now represent your insured. You, will, you need to make all communications through me. Um, and I, I will represent them in all aspects of the claim. Again, we do that. We have no problem. Um, if, if our insured has entered a contract with someone else, we will honor that contract. But we also have a contract with our insured that, that we will honor too. We have been paid to provide a service and we want to do that. Um, so actually while this bill was going through the process, um, some of our claim staff called and said, hey, I just got a call from a public adjuster. They're representing one of our insureds. Um, I haven't even heard from our insured to see if a claim is needed. Uh, what do I do? And we said, we'll reach out to the insured and make sure everything's okay, double check. Uh, that contract and that public adjuster had forged our insured signature. Um, so once we were able to obtain a copy of that and our insured was able to, we found they, they really hadn't entered that contract legally. And so we wanted those contracts to be able to be shared with the insurer so that we can honor our contracts with our insureds just as the public adjusters are there to honor theirs um, and, uh, and to provide the best service that we can. Um, again, the last point I really wanna make is that we have to be able to communicate with our insureds. They came to us and purchased our services. Uh, we wanna be able to con continue that. We are a grassroots organization, work very closely with our insureds. We're very hands-on, as I'm sure many other insurance companies are as well. Um, so we added language into um, our bill in Kentucky that says we can still communicate directly with our insureds. Um, and that we would include the public adjuster on that correspondence so they can also stay in the loop. We have no intention of cutting them out of the process, um, but we had the first contract, so we shouldn't be cut out of the process either. Um, and just to kind of go back, this bill came, um, again, from concerns brought to us by our members and our claim staff. We did work with the insurance industry in Kentucky uh, we worked with the Department of Insurance uh, in Kentucky. They were very supportive of this measure and then members of the General Assembly. Um, I'll turn it over to our Chairman, uh, Representative Meredith. So when we brought the bill and what we wanted to bring in this model as well was there were three focuses and that was consumer protection, transparency, transparency and preventing conflicts of interest. Uh, from a consumer protection standpoint, in our bill, what we did was we set caps on compensation thresholds. Uh, and so uh, 15% was the cap on non-catastrophic claims, 10% cap on catastrophic claims. We had started with a 10 across the board when the bill moved through the House. The final in the Senate ended up with a 15%. I know there are a few states that have already adopted that have lower fee caps than that. And so we don't wanna obvi obviously limit them in our language in the model from that perspective. We also make sure that the contracts that a public adjuster is going to have with the insured is reviewed and approved by the Department of Insurance before those contracts go out so that we know that that consumer is being protected through that contracting process. And we also allow the, com the Commissioner of Insurance to use the NAIC database to check the status of the public adjusters who may be coming in from another state to make sure that they are, are in good standing and don't have enforcement actions or things like that against them. From a transparency standpoint, we make sure, as Anne-Marie has already mentioned, that within 72 hours of the contract being signed, 
that the insurance company has the ability to, to get a copy of that contract uh, and ensures that the insured does still have the opportunity to communicate with uh, the insurance company. Uh, we, and, and I'll let Representative Lehman mention this. This was from the Indiana language uh, about prohibiting a public adjuster from filing a complaint without the express approval of the insured. You want to talk about that a little bit? This is what I thought okay. talk about. Um, and then from a conflict of interest standpoint and preventing conflicts of interest, we made sure in the model and in the Kentucky legislation that a public adjuster can't have a, a stake in a company that's pro or, or working on the home or the automobile, uh, whether that be a restoration contractor or a roofing contractor, they can't be a part owner of that or be getting a kickback from them uh, in, in the process. And so that is what we tried to do when we, when we did our, our law in Kentucky and what we seek to do in the national model that we bring before you today. All right, thank you. All right, in the interest of time, we're going to go a little bit over, but I'm going to ask the, the speakers to limit your comments to about 10 minutes. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Holly Soffer. I'm the general counsel for the American Association of Public Insurance Adjusters. Uh, first, I wanted to thank all of you for allowing us to speak um, at your committee meeting and also to give a special thank you to Senator Meredith who brokered the negotiations um, over the Kentucky legislation. And for the most part, we think it's a really good law. We think that, you know, we agree with a lot of the provisions in there, which are fair to both parties and provide a lot of consumer protection. We really only have a few issues where we would like to see the bill be optional, the act be optional in those sections to allow the individual states to decide what's best for them on some of those particular issues. And then for the most part, we think that the act will really work. So I'm gonna turn it over, and we will get to those issues as we go through. I'm gonna turn it over to Tony Delio, who's another um, attorney, almost a co-counsel for the association. And then we're going to have um, Cole Klein to his right. Tony will introduce us, who's the president, who's a public adjuster, just to give you a little more information on what a public adjuster does and how a claim works so that you can have more information and education. Thank you so much. Uh, again, my name is Tony Diulio. I'm an attorney that focuses my practice on first party litigation. So I'm helping uh, insureds on a daily basis try to make sure that their insurance coverage is appropriately interpreted. I know we're saving questions to the end. To the extent uh, you want to interrupt, we're welcoming it. Uh, I don't know if that's against the rules or not. Okay but questions help us really understand what your concerns are. And I wanna just by, uh, change it up a little bit by a show of hands, before reading this bill, who's actually knew what a public adjuster was and what they do? Who here's, who here's actually dealt with that? All right, there's a good number. It's surprising though when you're working in property and casualty, I ask that question often and people don't have an understanding of what public adjusters actually are, what they, what they help with. So we wanted to make sure we understood as an organization what they do. Public adjusters are substantive assistance for policyholders when they're dealing with losses. And catastrophic losses are a large portion, but really the mass majority of what public adjusters deal with are everyday claims. Plumbing losses uh, when a pipe breaks in your home, hail damage from a storm that comes by, a wind that damages shingles on your roof and your siding. Dealing with those types of claims are really what public adjusters do on a day-to-day -day basis. And our organization, Appia, represents all of those. From the small claims adjusters, they're dealing with ten, fifteen thousand dollar $15,000 claims and helping policyholders to the large loss, million dollar commercial claims as well. We are helping ensure compliance with policy conditions. You've got to remember that an insurance policy is just a contract, a very complicated contract and very confusing for policyholders. So when you have a public adjuster, they help understanding with that homeowner to know, hey, this is what your policy covers, this is what it does, and I'm going to help represent you. Because when you have these losses, and this is something we can all agree with, the policyholders are often in, in a, a state that they don't know what to do. They are confused, they are, are overwhelmed by damage to what is often their only major asset. So public adjusters step in and say, I don't want you to have to worry about that, we're here to help you. They provide that professional knowledge and assistance in that stressful time. 
Public adjusters do a ton on these claims. Now, I wanted to, I put a key facts that I need uh, to make sure I point out. Between 2016 and 2018, the average property damage claim was just $13,000. So we are not dealing with an industry that is overwhelmed with million dollar losses. We're dealing with much smaller claims. 92% of all insurance claims are under $25,000. And that's gonna be important when we're talking about these fee issues, because the reality is when you have a fee that is too low, you leave homeowners and consumers with no ability, no protection to have any assistance at all. There is certainly an argument to be made, and, and, and we'd support it, of saying, look, if someone's coming in and charging an exorbitant fee on an extremely large loss, the, the insurance departments can review that. Most of these insurance departments have a reasonableness requirement for a public adjuster's fee, and that can be reviewed without any other language within those provisions. But when you have those fees, you've got to recognize what it represents. You've got public adjusters who understand the policy language first and foremost. Consumers don't. It's, if you talk to your constituents, you're going to realize they have no idea what their insurance policy covers. That's why you need a public adjuster. They help identify damages, they outline repair methods, present the loss for inspection so that the homeowner doesn't need to be there, right? They, are the, they step into those shoes to be the assistance for the property owner. They advise the insureds on duties, like mitigating their damages, realizing, hey, you can't just sit back and let this get worse. Let me make sure you know what you need to do to protect your interests and comply with the policy. They coordinate those mitigation efforts bringing in uh, mitigation companies to help protect that property, document the claim through the entire process, and communicate with the carrier. They are the representatives of the insureds. Just as a brief background, as I mentioned, Appia represents all of those adjusters, the small guys to the big guys. Napio was also invited here. They are the National Association of Public Insurance Adjusters. They represent the large loss public adjusters across the country. Uh, they apologized that they couldn't make it. They had a, a, a plane issue uh, getting out here and weren't able to make it. Uh, I will, I'm going to skip through these slides as we, you guys kind of know who we are. Uh, I even put those nice little QR codes in there. If, uh, if anyone reviews these later, you can feel free to take a look. Uh, but what really this comes down to is how does a public adjuster in a day-to-day -day help these insureds? And I want to pass it over to the president, Cole Klein, to discuss exactly what he does just by way of some examples so that you can see firsthand how they're able to help uh, with these claims. Thanks, Tony. Uh, hello. Ho hope everybody's having a great morning. My name's Cole Klein, uh, president of the American Association of Public Insurance Adjusters. Um, and I'd like to talk to you about just what public adjusters do on a day-to-day -day basis with uh, residential uh, properties or average size losses that we handle every day uh, and as well uh, commercial property uh, losses and, and what those look like. Um, an important point uh, is insurance companies only pay for damage that is covered by the policy. Um, no uh, no claim is ever overpaid because a public adjuster is involved. Insurance companies uh, pay, uh, pay more or, uh, on, on claims that are increased because a public adjuster is involved because they present the claim uh, properly or find damage that just wasn't presented uh, prior. Uh, so this is a loss that uh, give you a real example of where a public adjuster can really provide value. Um, this is a, a loss where a vehicle impacted uh, the side of a home and the initial offer for settlement from the insurance company was around 23000 uh, The carrier in this, uh, this specific claim uh, offered to uh, patch a portion of, uh, reasonable, um, they offered to patch a portion of the brick on this uh, exterior. Um, with further documentation and uh, investigation of the property, uh, we learned that uh, the, the building had uh, just older building materials. Uh, instead of sheathing underneath of the brick, they had a product called Celotex. Um, this particular adjuster that worked this claim uh, from the, the insurer um, didn't know what Celotex was. It's just a, a, a product that's no longer used anymore. And the way that the the brick is tied into the side of the, uh, the structure, um, it wraps around the, the entire structure. So with uh, proper investigation and documentation and presentation from a public adjuster, uh, 
we were able to present the claim and the insured was able to be made whole, uh, which brought the claim from an initial uh, settlement offer of $23,000 to, to $92,000 where the insured wasn't able to repair their property before uh, they hired the public adjuster and, and gained their assistance. Um, really complex process. This homeowner also wasn't a construction professional and uh, he, you know, they, they didn't know the, the difference between sheathing and uh, Celotex material or uh, the variety of other uh, building components. So we, uh, we performed a study of 129 claims in 2022, and uh, the average uh, residential uh, roof increase um, after hiring a public adjuster was about 57,000. Uh, um, the average number of days to work that claim uh, was over a year, uh, 377, this is far from my eyes, uh, 377 days. Um, the average uh, residential increase on a fire uh, insurance claim uh, was 119,000, and the average number of days from the time they hired the public adjuster to uh, reach a final settlement with the insurance uh, carrier was just under a year, 332 days. Uh, and for, uh, of those 129, um, the average residential water damage increase was $52,000 and an average uh, timeline of 254 days. Um, of those uh, 129 claims, um, if a 15% fee cap was in place, 43 uh, of those uh, policyholders would not have received help. Um, and uh, so the average starting amount of those uh, 43 claims was uh, just above $3,000. And after, the, after uh, working with a public adjuster, uh, had an average ending amount of $30,000. And um, an average number of days from hiring the public adjuster to completion of the claim of 320 days. Um, so, uh, give you a couple other examples. Um, we recently had an insured who received an uh, estimate after they had a fire, and the insurer included uh, drywall in their estimate, and, uh, but the policyholder had plaster over metal lath, as well as the uh, adjuster detached and reset uh, the base shoe in the house. Um, but because the uh, the base shoe was made of a, just a, a lesser product. They weren't able to do so. Um, the homeowner didn't know uh, what plaster was, how it was repaired, uh, attached to the wall, or what was behind the plaster. And uh, with the help of a public adjuster, we were able to fix the errors that the, um, the adjuster uh, made and was able to help the homeowner navigate the claim. A lot of these issues were not due to um, inaccuracies or uh, intentional uh, fault of the insurance company, but just the skill set of public, uh, the insurance company's adjuster. Um, a lot of times, uh, especially in storm situations, there are um, just newer adjusters that are that are entered into the field for a lot of those reasons. Um, yep. Now I'm going to pass it to Holly to discuss uh, some specifics on the bill. Thank you. So as can you hear me? As we said, for the most part, we think the bill really works. There are uniform procedures for licensing and um, definitions of terms that help as you go from state to state. So I, we reprinted the bill here, but don't worry, we're not going to go through it line by line on the interest of time. So one just quick point, this is very minor. The bill requires a $50,000 bond. Most states have 20, and what we've suggested recently is that companies, a pu public adjusters form entities like LLCs or corporations, and those also need a license in most states. They should require a license in every state. We're 100% in favor of that. But maybe just put the $50,000 on the company and then allow the individuals to only have a $20,000 bond. This isn't really clear as to whether it would apply to the individuals or the company. We're really okay with it either way, but we think the company should have the 50, so just maybe tighten that language a little bit to make it clear um, in the final version. Um, the contract issues, this bill requires the public adjuster to have their contract pre-approved by the insurance commissioner. And the reason we wanted this optional is that 
it's just does, it won't work in a lot of states. Every state has different rules as to what should be in the contract. Some make it really easy and just put out a form and they say you must use this form. Texas, Pennsylvania, California has an optional form. That makes it really easy on the public adjusters. The department decides ahead of time what the contract should look like, boom, they're done and they don't have to worry about it. Requiring individual approval as the Kentucky Department of Insurance is learning, because I've been talking to them on the phone almost every day for the past two weeks, because one thing I do is write contracts for public adjusters. It's a lot of work, it's a lot of manpower, and a lot of the departments just don't have the budget for it. I've talked to them, they just refuse to do it. So we thought if you could just make that part optional, so either put in certain required language or a form contract, but requiring pre-approval should just be optional because it's I don't think that the insurance commissioners are all going to want to have to do that. So we, we would just stick in optional in front of certain provisions and we'll get to some of the others. The contractor issue, as has been brought up, is another issue that varies tremendously by state. Some states have a complete prohibition on a public adjuster being a contractor. Some allow it with re require disclosure. Some say you can do it whatever you want. There are no restrictions. It's moving in the direction of more restrictions. The problem we have with this language is that it's, it's not clear enough. So one model that, business model, that some public adjusters use is that they're hired by contractors to do the adjusting on a claim, especially a lot of commercial claims. Contractors are not public adjusters. And I know all of you and all of us are in favor of people having to be licensed to be a public adjuster. So we don't want unlicensed contractors to be adjusting claims. So very often they will say, we have this repair job, it's an insurance claim. We would like to hire a public adjuster on behalf of the insured and we will pay the public adjuster. That's the model in a lot of states. So One we minute. don't think this language is clear enough as to, um, so we would just, we can talk after this about tightening up that language to allow that and some other um, conduct. The really important issue that we, we wanted to talk about were the fee caps. Again, fees vary by state. There are only a handful of states that have caps on fees. Some are 20%, some are 33%. There are a few that are 10%. We are okay with the fee cap on the catastrophic losses for 10%. Those are big storms with widespread damage. And I know that um, Anne Marie Franklin talked a lot about the aftermath of a catastrophe. We're completely on board with that. It's just on those regular small claims that Tony and Cole talked about. Public adjusters can't afford to help people on claims that are small if their fee is limited to 15%. As Cole said, they're just gonna walk away from those claims and those people are left without any professional representation. And we talked to you about the value that public adjusters bring. So we would like to see, and, and you know, again, it's diff different states have different situations with regard to different weather patterns and the different needs for um, public adjusters and different laws. So we would like to either remove this or just see it be optional and let each state decide um, what they want to do with regard to public adjuster fees and do what works in their individual estate in order to protect uh, the consumers. And we can talk more about that and we were, are very happy to answer questions about that. Thank you. John. Um. So let me just say, we're, we're just skipping over the Napia slides because they weren't able to make it. I could narrate the Napia slides if you'd like. That might be more entertaining. Uh, hello everyone, John Schnauz, National Association of Mutual Insurance Companies. We're a national property and casualty trade association. Um, I'll try to be brief given the time constraints. Uh, our association does think the time is right for another look at a national public adjuster model. As many of you heard yesterday, there is an existing NAIC model, but we think there are some good opportunities here and have appreciated the conversation with Representative Meredith about areas where we think this model might be strengthened. Um, I think the context that he laid out of the bill in Kentucky is important. 
So in Kentucky, they were writing on a, a canvas there where there was very little restriction. I think the example Anne Marie gave of a 35% commission on a policy that was going to be paid limits regardless is a pretty good example of how little Kentucky had on the books before his bill. Not every state is that way. Um, Texas was mentioned. Texas has had a comprehensive uh, public adjuster statute for 20 years. It predates the NAIC model. In our opinion, it is stronger than the NAIC model in a couple of uh, factors that I'll point out. So we do think it's important to look at the context of the Kentucky bill. Um, a few specifics. So the fee issue has come up. I want to address that specifically. Texas, since 2003, has had an across-the-board 10% limit on public adjuster fees. It applies to catastrophic and non-catastrophic claims. We have no shortage of public adjusters. The last time I looked at the licensure count, we have more than 1,400. Uh, in fact, we have a state public adjuster trade association, which most states don't have. We work with them often on legislation. So I think the idea that that has prevented public adjusters from helping people is proven otherwise in Texas. We also have, as Holly mentioned, we have a form contract. It is the only contract that a public adjuster can use. That's a very easy way to simplify the Department approval process is have one contract and that's it. You don't have to worry about reviewing. Um, a few other specific provisions. Um, there's a, a prohibition in the bill very appropriately on public adjusters giving legal advice. They should not be doing that hard stop. Um, the way the language from the Kentucky bill is phrased has a little bit of wiggle room that maybe we're only talking about bodily injury claims and that shouldn't be the case. Public adjusters are not lawyers unless they happen to be lawyers. So um, we want to clarify that provision. Um, finally, I, I want to address a specific provision in the bill that hasn't come up yet that we think is potentially problematic. And that is, there's a section, uh, section 3.1b of the bill that creates a circumstance in which a public adjuster can be compensated by the policyholder prior to a written contract being in place. Um, and it references this happening in an emergency situation. Um, that really raises a red flag for us. Uh, we think it needs a second look or a third one or however many looks to take until it um, is changed because, uh, frankly, that provision is, is directly contrary to some things in the NAIC model. Both the NAIC model and Texas law, public adjusters can't even solicit during a loss uh, producing event, much less collect money. Um, the NAIC model has an optional provision and the Texas law has a provision that prevents them collecting money pre-settlement. This provision isn't even pre-settlement, it's pre-contract, and that we think is, is a potential for abuse and ought to be looked at. Um, there are some other good provisions we think from the Texas law that might be put in. We've talked about some of these, Representative Meredith. Um, prohibitions or controls on referral fees, that is a common area for abuse. And then finally, um, the model we think should cover entities who are holding themselves out to be public adjusters but are not actually licensed. And there's a provision in the Texas law that says if someone is doing that, the policyholder can void the contract. So um, we want that in place just to make sure we don't reward people who don't actually get licensed. Happy to stay engaged on the model. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you for the time. Thank you. In the interest of time, I'm going to make a few comments. I'm going to go to Delegate Westfall, and then I'm going to go to uh, Representative Meredith, and then Representative Lehman to close. Let me just say a couple of things. Uh, we've had this issue in Louisiana. In Louisiana, we don't allow for contingency fee contracts at all. Um, two of the things I saw on the slide disturbed me, and I can tell you as part of the issue that we've had. When uh, you're interpreting contracts and you're talking about understanding policy language, and advising on duties in Louisiana, that would be considered the unauthorized practice of law, so we don't allow that either. So those are two of the big issues, I think, that, that we've had with that. I'm not necessarily asking for responses. I'm just telling you those are some of the issues that we have. Do you have. mind if I just comment? I think you're making the point that I made that um, some of the provisions should be optional because there are differences in the law in the various states, nope. and a nope. lot of this will not work in Louisiana. No problem. All right, we're going to go to Delegate Westfall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't have a question or a comment. That if it's possible, I could be added as co-sponsor of this bill. I plan to run this in West Virginia in January. Yeah, if it's I'll possible. leave that up no. to the office. Sure. All right. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Mayor. 
Yeah, and I mean, the, I, the issue of fee caps keeps coming up and has been talked about over and over again on this. I think it's really important that the fee <coughs> cap is a low fee cap. I know what they're saying, but you got to understand any of this contingency money is coming out of the claim that is being paid for the repair on a piece of property or on an automobile or whatever it may be. And whatever less money that insured is getting is the money they don't have to restore their loss. And so I think that fee cap is extremely important. If, may I just respond on that? I understand the concept. The concern we have is when an insured is owed, let's say, 20000 on a claim, but the carrier, for, you know, overworked, might miss something and is paid 3000 isn't it better to have a professional come in to assist them to make sure they get the additional 17000 on that claim that they are owed, even if it's above 15% on the contingency fee? I mean, otherwise, we are leaving potentially 92% of insureds who have claims without any way to get professional assistance in the event that things are missed. And we are really, as much as you are, concerned about protecting the consumer here. This isn't about the public adjuster. It's about protecting that consumer and giving them an option. Um, and, and comments were made that the fee cap works in states like Texas and New York that have the fee caps, but sometimes there are other provisions in the law. For instance, Texas, um, a lot of public adjusters will do what's like an over and above fee. They'll charge 25% on what they recover as long as it doesn't exceed 10% of the, the claim. And actually on small claims, I'm familiar with TAPIA, the association, we work with them. On some of the smaller claims, what happens is the public adjusters don't take the claim at all. And then they get a referral fee from a contractor because they're not the public adjuster. And we think that that shouldn't be allowed and it really doesn't help the homeowner in the end because they're not having professional representation because the public adjuster, as Cole said, would walk away from those really small claims, which are the majority of claims. Representative Lane. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to uh, thank Representative Merritt for bringing this. It, I guess I want to kind of take a 30,000 foot view as we wrap this up, and that is I think that, uh, first of all, thank you to the industry for being here and, 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 and giving your opinion. I think what I heard when we did this in Indiana, uh, Coles and Moffs a couple different times, is every, even this industry wants to get the bad actors out. 100%. Um, they want to get the bad actors out. And, and when you talked about, you talked about confusion, what we have seen as an independent agent, what I've seen over my career of 30 years has been the confusion begins when they sign these contracts. So again, bad actors have to be out. Um, I think the philosophy at Incol that's been the time I've been here has been, you know, we, we build it, we try to build a strong foundation that you can take back to your states and then implement where you think it best fits your constituency. So I'm looking forward to continue to build on this foundation. And I think there are issues around like the bond amount and, you know, the DOI review and even fees that maybe is going to be unique to different states based on different pieces. Um, We'll continue to work on that, I think, within this model. I think there's issues around when payments can be paid um, and, and not taking all, your, all of my money up front. Uh, the big issue we had in Indiana uh, and, and with the DOI and, and NEIC was complaints. Um, they were seeing, I, I brought this up in an NEIC meeting, and everybody looked at me like, I, you know, like they didn't want to talk about it, but the reality was when they finally spoke, they said we're getting multiple complaints from the adjusters, not from the insureds. And we have to respond to those. And so in this model, it talks about that it has to be the written consent. My only concern there is, does it just get put into the contract? So when I signed this contract, it says, I have a right to file a complaint. Now I never have to get your consent in the future. We, and so now I can file a complaint yeah, after complaint. Yeah. So I think those are just some things I think we'll continue to work on. Yep. Because I think at the end of the day, we all want the same thing. And that is to get the bad actors out. Because they are... Uh, create quite the havoc in this yeah. industry. So 100%. thank you, Representative Mayor, for bringing this. Yeah. Looking forward to working in the future. And I want to thank the speakers. And we're not going to have an opportunity to respond to Representative Lehman's comments. If you want to do that, you can certainly do it offline. But if you have any comments in the future, you can certainly reach out to me, Representative Lehman, Representative uh, Meredith, and now Delegate Westfall, <laughs> uh, or the in-call staff. Again, we apologize on time, but because staff does such a great job of putting on all these interesting topics, we uh, sometimes we go a little bit over. But, and we, of but course, encourage everyone to reach out to us. As questions arise, we are here to be a resource. We are in agreement with most of this. Transparency is a good thing for everybody, and we, wanna, we all want to protect the consumer. No problem. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.
All right. Oh, by the way, somebody, one of the prior speakers left a button up here, yeah. so I'm just mentioning that if someone's missing a gold button. All right. Thank you so much. All right, last on our agenda is the reconsideration of readoption of uh, existing in call model laws per in call bylaws. All model laws must be readopted every five years or else they sunset. Those models appear in your binders starting on page 321 and all the following. The Model State Uniform Building Code, Consumer Protection Towing Model Act, Model Act regarding auto airbag fraud, Model Act regarding disclosure and rental damage waivers, Model Anti Runners Fraud Bill, and lastly, the Property and Casualty Insurance Domestic Violence Model Act. Are there any questions or comments on these models? Mr. Chairman. Yes. Carl Anderson from South Carolina. Uh, is it possible for us to uh, vote on these all at one time? We will, except for the uh, state model uniform building code, uh, because we still have some work on that one. We're going to uh, take that one separately. In fact, um, I'll entertain a motion to readopt those models, except for the one I just mentioned. So moved, Mr. Chair. Second. The second has been probably moved and second. All in favor? Opposed? All right. Returning to the state uh, uniform model building code, as I just said, since there are some proposed amendments, we're going to continue working on that, and I'll entertain a motion to readopt the model until our next meeting in November rather than the full five years. Mr. Chair, I so move. I'll entertain second. a second. Probably move a second. All in favor? Opposed? All right, that is approved as well. Do we have any other business? Delegate Westbrook. You thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in November, if possible, I think we need to relook at the delivery network bill that we passed here. I was co-sponsor of that with um, the, the representative from Kentucky. There's been some language that's been, I think, agreed to by different parties. There's only one state that has passed that so far. I think it's been North Dakota. We tried to in West Virginia. I think Kentucky tried to also. There's a stumbling block on the delivery part for the bigger carriers. I think there's language out there now that both sides agree to. And if possible, I'd like to offer an amendment in November to that model act, the Delivery Network Act bill. I just right. thought I'd bring it to your attention. I'll ask staff to put it on the agenda for the November meeting. Thank you. It possibly a, a interim call if possible, so Mr. Chair. We about. can do that. We'll set okay. that up. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Any other business that we have? All right. Uh, if there's no other business before this committee, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Second? All in favor? Opposed? All right. Uh, this meeting is adjourned, and we have a five-minute break until our next meeting. Thank you.